So I gave this talk to um, a wireless group in Portland. And I was kind of hoping we would have more students here because some of this you may already know. Um, this, of course, is Hedy Lamar, who filed this patent on sped, spread spectrum communications in the 40s. So uh, I'm hoping that in this audience is the next person who's going to file a critical breakthrough patent like this. And again, if, if you uh, work with students or young people, you should be encouraging them to be that person. So I'm going to be discussing uh, time domain versus frequency domain, spectrum, these charts, uh, digital modulation, uh, radio certification, a little bit about open source software. I'm more of a hardware and systems person, and I'm sure you are the software experts. So uh, you, you can kind of use this framework to dig in if you don't already know it all. And uh, again, since I thought we'd have more students, I had some ideas about you know, what you should study if you want to get your PhD in wireless and earn the big bucks. And I have a little bit of discussion of radios and health if people want to hear that. So time domain is the horizontal axis is time. In frequency domain, the horizontal axis is frequency, and you can think of it as a piano, the, the, the width of the piano from the lowest to the highest is a frequency domain representation and a control system. Uh, if you look at the frequency domain, that little blue uh, glyph above frequency, You'll have the, the pure, pure fundamental frequency, which is a sine wave, but usually there'll be harmonics around it. It's very difficult to build a physical oscillator. It's impossible to build a physical oscillator that produces a pure fundamental and no nothing else. And you can never build a perfect amplifier that if you feed that signal in, you get only what you fed in out. And so that leads to a lot of things we have to do in practice. Uh, the beauty is that you can very quickly convert in software between time domain and frequency domain, as I will discuss. So this is the chart you have. Ooh, it looks terrible. I'm sorry. Uh, but at the very top row is the very lowest frequency. So those are the frequencies we use to communicate with submarines underwater as it travels through the Earth. And each decade of frequency increases from left to right. So we get down here to the far right, uh, which is in the, I think, 30 or 60 gigahertz range. Um, this is a log scale within each row, and so those big spaces at the lower frequencies are really not that many hertz. And uh, that big blue block on the second row, I believe, is uh, television broadcast. Again, you'll, you'll need the magnifying glass to, to see that. AM radio. Oh, AM radio. Yeah, which, like how much bandwidth is there? A couple, you know, tens of kilohertz. Um, this bottom row here, which, again, I'm very sorry this came out this way, but the bottom row is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So you go from these very low, you know, submarine wavelengths. Radio waves is this section here. So this is all of that. And you go all the way up to X-ray and gamma rays. So 
The electromagnetic spectrum is photons. We don't usually think of very low frequency photons in radio waves as photons, but they are. And they demonstrate that wave particle duality more on the wave side, right? Um, and I'm going to discuss in a minute the ISM band, but the point of this is that the radio frequency spectrum assignments, which are done by a working group within the United Nations, are, they're all filled. <laughs> but they're not always used all at the same time, which is at least the idea of cognitive radio, where you would kind of listen to see if nothing is happening and, and you know, if you're allowed to transmit in that band and nothing's happening, you could do so. Um, and generally what happens is the, the mobile frequencies are between about 500 megahertz and you know, up to maybe 21, 23, uh, hundred megahertz, so you know, 2.3 gig. And as you get above that, they tend to be more directional and uh, travel less far with the same amount of power. So the, the mobile industry, you know, which we carry in our pocket, is always gobbling up the adjacent spectrum, um, which might be able to be used for something else. So I guess it depends on what's more important, downloading, you're watching Netflix you know, on your phone, or something else. So most of the things that you would find uh, at this conference use standardized radios and the ISM bands. And so what the ISM bands are bands that have been identified that uh, you can transmit a certain amount of power, certain amount of energy density uh, with certain kind of antennas that aren't, you know, too powerful, so you, you can share it with other people. Uh, but that also means if you use one and somebody interferes with you, it's a delicate discussion of who's right and who's wrong, who has to get off, and there's, there's no guarantees. So, you have to pick where you're going to be on that chart and buy a radio from one of our sponsors and uh, hopefully it's certified and then figure out what you're going to do with your antenna and your software and your power supply. Um, so this ISM band, it's great because uh, it, does, it doesn't require a lot to use it. You don't have to buy spectrum from the government and in the case of the US government, they used to just give it away, and now they discovered they can sell it. So you might have to buy it. In your ISM, you don't have to. Higher frequencies, you know, shorter distance, it can travel. So if you, you know, the closer you have to be between transmitter and receiver, and if you're trying to build a large network, like a telephone network, you need a lot of antennas. Um, you know, the more transmit power you need, the more power the, the power amp and the transmitter uses. So the more batteries you need. Um, if you're traveling in a, a jet or in a satellite, you're going to get Doppler distortion. So you have to take that into account in the design of the radio system. Um, one of the, thing, the neat things you can do is MIMO. So I'm sure you've seen those home routers with six antennas or four antennas, or they'll probably put fake antennas, so it'll be like a porcupine. But that allows you to transmit more data or to uh, reduce your no noise margin. So you kind of can trade those off uh, by the number of radios and antennas and receivers. Um, you can build a very exotic antenna that does beam steering. So that's what uh, what's the satellite system uh, from Musk? Starlink. 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 So that's what Starlink does. 
There's some wonderful teardown videos on YouTube where somebody tore it down and probably you'll be able to buy used ones and mod them. And there are also chips from various manufacturers that would allow you to build uh, beam steering antennas, but the Starlink is sold at a loss so on the hardware, so it's probably you want to hack something. If you want to do it cheap, but do it legally and be very aware of what you're doing in the spectrum. Um, you can band together different um, channels and radio protocols, especially on mobile phones. You can even use multiple carriers at the same time to increase your data throughput. But again, it becomes more and more complex. Um, In digital modulation, we send radio packets. There's sort of a burst of data, and then usually there's like a little wait time or a long wait time, and you send a burst of data. So how long do you make the packet? Well, if you have error protection on the packet, uh, the longer the packet, the greater probability you'll have an error, which then means you need to retransmit or recover using, uh, you know, error control bits. Uh, anything to improve security also costs. Um, the, the big specs like uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi take years to develop. So if you're interested, you can kind of get in early and all the development process that are public, uh, they, you know, they may not take your input on redesigning it, but you can at least follow what's being done, and then there's, you know, the spec is thousands of pages long. So it's all open source in a way, but there also is intellectual property, which if you want to use it, you may need to license if you want to be legal. So they usually pull the intellectual property into a, a batch that's easier to license. Um, but I worked on, on WiMAX, which was a candidate for 4G that lost. But a big part of the entire motivation for WiMAX, which descended from an IEEE working group, as opposed to descending from the European mobile phone standardization branch, the entire purpose, let me put this quick diplomatically, one of the advantages that WiMAX had it been accepted would have been to minimize the uh, Qualcomm IP in 4G. So, you know, we're down to the hardware and code and all that, but there's a lot of IP politics in these big stakes games. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about analog modulation. If you're interested in analog modulation, you can get an old VCR, and on the back, there's a little coax connector, and it will broadcast on uh, channel three analog television, which you then can plug into an analog television with a coax input and an analog tuner and watch channel three, you know, from your VCR. Um, you know, FM, obviously, AM, there are, you know, probably many uh, analog magic modulation schemes, but today everything is digital modulation. So what is digital modulation? You have a, a sine wave that's a carrier up in the upper left, which is not, again, not, not the pure sine waves. It's got some other side bands and harmonics. Uh, you can break up your world into cells with antennas pointing in three directions with their own independent data communication and different frequencies. 
there's a in the telephone network, the mobile phone network, for historic reasons, because radios were terrible, they originally des uh, designed them to use frequency division multiplexing. That's represented by, let's just say FDD here. So one band will be used for transmitting one set of frequencies, and the other band will be for receiving. Unfortunately, the, the LTE spec is very complex, so there are multiple options uh, for which bands to use for transmit and receive, and they could be swapped in different variations. But it would be a lot more efficient to use time division multiplexing, where you, you transmit for a certain amount of time, you stop, the, the receiving device switches over, and then you switch to receive. So, trans so you transmit from the antenna for a while, stop, and then your main antenna receives and vice versa. Because most of the time we're sending the data to the subscriber on their mobile phone. And so if you're developing some sort of a radio project, you know, like the kind of things that uh, people that come to this conference develop, you have to think through, you know, what are you sending and what are you receiving? What's the relative time uh, criticality? And what's the data volume? And how does that affect the complexity of the radio? Uh, in the you know, current phones, we're getting up to about 2,000 carriers for transmit, 2,000 for receive in a 20 megahertz channel, but some of the older uh, mobile phone technologies have like, you know, three to four megahertz channels. So, you know, as time goes on, you want bigger channels, but then that means the radio has to be more complex. So, heterodyne, how many people know about heterodyne? There's a couple, yeah. So, the idea is if you, if you mix two frequencies in a nonlinear medium, you'll get those two frequencies out. You'll also get the sum of the frequencies and the difference of the frequencies. You put two frequencies in, you get four out. And that's exactly how you tune a guitar using beats. You want to null out the difference beats and then you know, you have the, the guitar and the tuning source are the, the same frequency. In a radio, the mixer does that. So you feed a reference local oscillator into the mixer and your uh, encoded frequency and it generates the sum and the difference which you end up using for transmit and receive, as I'll show you. So if you're transmitting, you generate the equivalent of all the sine waves of all the carriers you want on, and, and obviously not the ones you went off. You feed it to the mixer, the mixer jumps it up to whatever your very high transmit frequency is that goes out the antenna. And the receiver does the reverse. The antenna is tuned to be relatively frequency selective. Then it usually goes through a filter. So if there's some other radio transmitter out there that you don't want, it's filtered out and doesn't overload the receive circuitry. Then you use the mixer to down mix it to something your A to D converter can understand. So you're not building a, a gigahertz capable A to D converter. You're building a 20 megahertz or 40 megahertz A to D converter. This is uh, basically what I said. Once it goes through the 
A to D converter uses the fast Fourier transform form to uh, transmit it to translate it back down to your bits. And if you're transmitting, you do the reverse. You use the fast Fourier transform form um, to generate the equivalent of the all the sine waves in your carrier for your carrier. Um, radio frames are a lot like an Ethernet frame on a wire or you know obviously Wi-Fi is like this. You have a a preamble and then you might have your source and destination, you have your data, and you have your error protection. And you might have a post amble that says this is the end of this radio packet. You send that out, and all the receivers are listening, and they're listening for the preamble. Say, okay, there's a packet, and this is the start of the packet. But the problem is, the higher the frequency, the more you get reflections of the original transmitted signal off of buildings on their way to the receive antenna. So one of the things the signal processing has to do in the receiver is find the one true packet and throw out all the reflections, which of course are in random, not random, in time alignment based on how far they had to travel based on what they reflected off of. So if you're going to buy a receiver from one of our sponsors, this is all taken care of, but somewhere in the code, all this stuff exists if you dig deep enough. So just be aware, you probably don't want to dig that deep, but it's there. Layered software stacks, this is something everybody should probably be familiar with. You know, when you pick your radio, the vendor will know who has software stacks for it. And a lot of them are open source, developed by maybe even people in this room. So the question is, you know, what is the software stack you're going to use? Where are you going to interface with it? And what are you going to kind of leave as the built-in functionality that was coded? Um, so I came kind of thinking we'd have this room filled with students because it's Portland State. And they would be talking about how they're going to go out and buy a jammer off of Alibaba, and, was, and the whole point of the talk was like, don't do that, and the reason is, first, those transmitters, because they're not, no one ever tested them, that you can trust the test. Check to see what spectrum they're putting out beyond what they say they're putting out, or what if you just wanted to jam one little thing, what they would be putting out, and they could also have all kinds of garbage because of the harmonics in the circuitry. Um, when any, any project you have to start about what, what is the, who's the customer, what's the use case? You know, so start there. In, in many cases, you'll be copying the use case. So that's, that's great too. Um, and then, as I said, select your, your ecosystem you're going to work in to do your project. Uh, so, you know, what, if you're a student, you know, what should you be studying? Um, I talked a little bit here about analog stuff, and, you know, you don't have to study that, but if you want to work on the antenna part or the power amplifiers or the filters, you should study that. Uh, you definitely need fields and waves, that's the antenna and propagation. Um, digital signal processing, because that's always evolving. As compute power increases, you have more you can do with coding and decoding and compression and so forth. Um, if you are building something with batteries, you have to be aware of power. And I looked into this quite a bit 
in my consulting with another large company. And the, the current theory is what you want to do, you know, first your, your transmitter takes all the power. Right? Your receiver doesn't take much power, your filter doesn't take any power, your AD converter and processor takes a little power, but your transmitter takes the power. So what you want to do is, is run fast, using a lot of power, transmit everything you need to do, and then power everything down. And if you're talking about the code for you know, the data processing, your compilers, many compilers are power aware. So you, know, you, you need to understand how to trigger that in the compiler, but a lot of that is taken care of. But at the application layer, you need to plan when you're going to run your power amp on the transmit side. Um, digital communications overlaps with digital signal processing, but it's kind of a higher layer. That's all that kind of networking layer stuff, um, which also goes with all the control layers and how does how do you how does the the transmitter and receiver find each other. Um, machine learning is all, always going to be spreading across this whole space. Um, I don't know the graduate programs that are great in this, but if I wanted to find out what I would do is I would look at, uh, through LinkedIn, who the top universities hire to be professors, who the top commercial entities hire to be researchers or product development people. Um, what everybody learns now in engineering school is simulation, right? And there's going to be many different areas of simulation to solve a problem, and you're going to have to use them all in many cases. So you're going to be learning in your program several you know, simulation modeling tools, but you're going to have to, through your career, learn the next one as well. Um, as I say, you know, research who's being hired to figure out, you know, what schools they're coming from, and then select those schools if you if that's possible. Uh, and then it's also fun to get an amateur radio license because it it's very easy, and it opens up some bands. Uh, that you can use that other people can't. Uh, plus, you'll meet crazy people. So, <laughs> and I had an unusual experience where I was traveling uh, in Africa. This was quite a while ago. And, and the way I found the contact who was going to help me out in the next city was through this network of amateur radio people that talked to each other all the time just for fun and to see how far they could talk and who they could have as friends across the world. So uh, it's not hard. There's usually local groups that will help you to get it in each town. Um, this is a list of, you know, the, this, the, this is the website for the allocation chart. Uh, then the next level up in the UN of world charts, which differ by region. So, you know, U.S. and Canada are similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, and then it would be different in Europe and so forth. Uh, then there's a whole series of U.S. FCC websites where you can find where they tested new radio devices or even ones you're considering buying or ones that, that are interfering with your project. Um, so that's a useful uh, tool. Questions, and then I'll have a little bit about health if people want to talk about that. When you're talking about um, uh, time between multiple multiple versus frequency, yep, yep. You, you didn't also talk about code domain. You're right, yes. Yeah. It's and, actually much gone away at this point. Um, 
mean, that was, that was Qualcomm's bread and butter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't think it's, it's completely dead, but it's, it's all the new mobile radio specs don't use it. You know, code domain is essentially that hey, Lamar concept um, where you decide which carriers you're going to use based on a code, and you keep changing that code, and the receiver also knows that code and the time sequence, so you can kind of, the whole idea of her patent was that you could make secret communications because the people who didn't want to listen wouldn't know the code. <laughs> there may be some exotic way to get around that now, you can just kind of gather everything and you know, post-process it. Just touch on this. Um, oh, this is a funny thing. There's a guy at Intel named Kevin Kahn, and uh, he's a very smart guy, but they used to also call him the Rat of Kahn. <laughs> and he, he did a lot of different jobs, and he got to a very senior level where they basically let him do whatever he wanted to do, and he became interested in radios. We talked about how someday, which is right about now, we'll all be carrying 100 radios on our body, right? So the transmit is, is, is one radio, the receiver is one, one radio, then you have multiple bands, you have multiple protocols, you've got you know, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all of your various multiple mobile radios for the, the public network and so forth. Maybe you'll have something that's transmitting some medical sensor uh, to, you know, with your phone, your watch sends it, sends, it, sends it to your phone. So there are a lot of transmitters in the world. And then, of course, at your home, your, your appliances have radios and your car has radios and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, uh, wireless barcodes are radios. Um, so it's a good area to, to be in. And you, you will have to specialize because it's such a huge field. So I had a professor that studied this. In the old days, what you'd do is you would take rats and you'd expose them to you know, a thousand times whatever you thought was bad. Uh, and then you'd kill them and operate on them and count the tumors. So we, we've gotten better than that. There's an important chart, which I unfortunately didn't bring, which talks about the human body exposure to radio uh, limits, suggested limits. And they suggest a lower limit where the wavelength of the radio wave is about the size of your body. You know, your body is, you know, meter and a half tall, two meters tall. So the idea is, like with any wave, it's going to couple into things that are the same size. It's going to couple into an antenna that is roughly the same size. It's not going to couple into something that's super small or super large in relation to the size of the wavelength. Now, it is certainly clear that uh, radio waves can produce heating and you, you know, the, the proven problem with that is the effect on the eye and cataracts. So it dries out all the liquids in the eye and messes up the, the lens. So that's why you probably, that's why people who climb television towers to change the light bulbs have you know, a certain number of minutes per year they're allowed to do that. And it's probably also a very dangerous job to be on a Navy ship standing in front of a huge you know, radar transmitter. So there are certain known problems, but the question is, uh, what about the unknown problems? And there's been a lot of noise in the press, and of course a lot of researchers would love to discover you know, that it is terrible, and they discovered it. But I don't think that it's, it's been found. You know, your body is salt water, which is a conductor. So radio waves don't penetrate very far in a conductor. 
So you have to look up for the power and the frequency, what's the, the skin depth of penetration into your body. And it's not that deep for most frequencies. Um, the field, field strength is very low. So yeah, if you're in front of a giant radar transmitting antenna, uh, it could be a lot of power, but your average base station for our mobile phone network is not a lot of power. If you're really you know, concerned about uh, exposure to radio waves in the mobile network, you shouldn't have a phone because it's your phone transmitter, which you're carrying, which is gonna produce more electromagnetic intensity than that mobile base station antenna that's quarter mile away or half mile away or a mile away. So if you're, if you're paranoid about radio waves, don't have them. Um, and then, I don't know if I want to go too deeply into this, but basically what the body is is, is our cells, and they are uh, manufacturing proteins and copying their genetic information, their DNA, to then divide into, to, into new cells. So if there's an error, and there are errors all the time, the immune system will find that bad protein usually, or a cell that has a bad copy of DNA that is still functional but not working the way it should, and flush it out of the system. So you don't have to live a pure life if you have a good immune system. Now, if you're young, you have a good immune system. If you're old like me, it's kind of, you know, winding down. And of course, you can have various medical conditions that cause your immune system to not be at peak, as we've discovered over the last you know, uh, several years. So the point is that you probably cause more damage to your body being paranoid and worried and stressed about the effect of radio waves on it than the radio waves themselves. So that's it. So get over to Control-H, um, have fun, enjoy the rest of the conference.